We've been asking that question over the last few weeks, and this is our final fifth message on this series of asking the question, who's your one? Who's the one person that God would lay on your heart for the next 365 days that you'd pray for an opportunity, take the opportunity to share Christ with them, to tell them about Jesus Christ and how wonderful He is and how He can forgive sin and all the great things He's done in your life and in somebody else's life as well, that you can just give testimony of that. We've been asking that question, who's your one? And here's what's been great is we have been finding out and having the Lord lay on our hearts with all of our campuses, hundreds and hundreds of people. So in Siena and downtown and in uh, Cyprus as well in the loop, everybody's saying, well, who's the one? Who's the one that you want to lay on my heart that I can share Christ with over the next year? And I want you to know, God's laid on my heart who my one is. And so I've texted them. I've called them. I asked them this week if they would want to go to dinner or to lunch or to get coffee. And let me tell you what God did. They said no, is what they said. So I'm going to have to keep at it and keep praying and keep going for it a little bit. They weren't able to do it, so I didn't take too much of offense, but I want you to know that each day I've been praying for this person. Each day I've been lifting up their name to the Lord. I've been asking God to give me an opportunity to open a door, but other folks have had some amazing success. We've heard from people that God's laid a person on their heart and that they've been able to share Christ with their friend or family member, and they have actually, in these weeks, we've seen people come to Jesus Christ as Savior through this time. Can we just applaud for that at all campuses? So exciting that we get to be a part of life change life change. We're going to be in John chapter 1, verse 40 through 42 is where we're going to be. Our last message on who's your one. Next week, uh, we're going to kick off a series called the Life Series, hashtag life. And basically, we're going to look at different stages of life. And so we're going to look at different stages. You might not be in one of those stages. That's okay. It's going to be a tool for us to minister to people in those stages. And it's also going to be truth for us if we're in those stages. So next week, students, I'm going to be talking specifically to you. Then we're going to talk about singles. We're going to talk about married. We're going to do a parenting series. We're going to talk about midlife. We're going to go through a whole deal to be able to understand these things of where we are in the journey. So I hope that you'll make an effort to be back for these next weeks as well. John chapter 1 is where we're going to be. But before we get there, we're talking about a guy named Andrew is what we're talking about this week. Andrew is an amazing man. Do you know that, guys, Andrew, the name Andrew means manly is what it means. So this is a solid name here we've got here. Andrew is a guy that was used by God, we'll see, to touch one person, Peter, and that one person of Peter is going to touch thousands of people. Then we're going to also see that, that Andrew, or we could see for, uh, earlier in the Scripture of John 1, that Andrew was the first of all disciples to be called by God. He appears in the New Testament nine times, and every time he appears, it's kind of a passing thought. He's always bringing somebody to Jesus. It's not a real focus on Andrew, but God used him in a great way. Why did God use him? God used him because he he understood who God was. Last week, we had a heavy-duty message. If you didn't hear it, you need to go online and check it out. It was a big message. We talked about heaven. We talked about hell. I got all sorts of encouragement. I I guess I should talk about hell more. I mean, it was like, everybody's like, man, what? a great message on hell that that you could go to heaven was what it was all about. That was the end thing. But we use this graph, and you some folks pulled out their phones and took a picture of it, so you could do that on the screen if you want to. But to talk about who God is, who God is, that He's holy, He's different, He's other, He's pure, He's perfect. There's no blemish in Him. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's the number one thing of God. And he is from his holiness, he's majestic. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. He sits on a throne right now. The temple is filled with the train of his robe. But at the same time, he's intimate. He knows every hair on your head, every tear that you've ever cried. He's a God of grace. He could forgive you of any sin, no matter how bad it is. You can be forgiven in Jesus Christ through his grace. And at the same time, he doesn't look over sin. And there's judgment that comes and there's justice. See, Andrew knew all of these things about God. He knew that God was a judge, a king, a friend, a father. If he's majestic in justice, then he's going to be a judge. If he's majestic and and graceful, then he's a king, a benevolent dictator, if you will. A grace and intimate, he's going to be a friend, the six closer than a brother. Justice and intimacy, our father who art in heaven. So when we put all these things together, well, which one of these is God? Yes, he's all of these things. And Andrew knew that to such an extent. He said, this has changed my life. I want now to bring people to Jesus. 
You'll find here when you read about Andrew, Andrew's not uh, arguing with people about Jesus. He's not trying to force people to Jesus. He just basically says, hey, come meet my friend over here. I want to show you who Jesus is. And lives are changed. I'm going to give you four things that Andrew did for us to take into our own hearts. Let's look at John chapter 1, verse 40 through 42. Here's what it says. Andrew, there's our guy, Simon Peter's brother, did you know he's Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed him. That happened previously in the chapter. First, he found his own brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And, we, and then he brought Simon, that's Peter, to Jesus. And when Jesus saw him, he said, you are Simon, son of John. And you shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. So here we have this moment where Peter is brought to Jesus by Andrew. Here's the first thing we got to know about Andrew. Andrew knew the value of individual people. Andrew knew the value of individual people. With seven billion people in the world, do we still appreciate the single soul that works in your office place? The single soul that lives across the hall from you in your apartment complex. The single soul across the street from your house. The single soul in your, your workplace. Do we appreciate or we've gotten so just enamored with the big numbers? I've said to you before that we're either going to see people as scenery, machinery, or ministry. Scenery, what are all these people doing here? Why is all this traffic here? Machinery, can I have another glass of tea? It's time for the check. We're ready to leave the restaurant. Machine, or ministry, I, I want to see you as a soul and minister to you. See, Andrew saw Peter and saw Jesus as Jesus saw him as a soul. He saw one by one. Now, it's been said before, and it's oftentimes true, preachers like it big, people like it small. And so even though I love preaching to thousands, that's a blessing. I still want to be a person that sees the individual and looks them in the eye. I still want to be the person that has time for somebody to be able to share Christ with them. Just last week after the message here at the Loop Campus, I was able to lead somebody to Christ right here at the front altar. It was awesome. What a great blessing. So God wants us to see individuals, to appreciate the single soul. Andrew was known for bringing individuals, not crowds, to Jesus. Every time we see the gospel account in, in the gospels, we see Andrew bringing somebody to Christ. Now, he brought Peter, and Peter would bring thousands. Remember, Peter preached at Pentecost, the beginning of the church. Thousands came to Christ. People come to Christ mainly, though, because of individual relationships, not because of just mass meetings. We're all for that. We think Billy Graham and his whole ministry is great. We love all those other ministries like that. We love church on a Sunday morning, no question. But it comes down to that one-by-one -one interaction of one being brought to Christ Jesus. Now, just to, to give you a couple thoughts on this, who's your one? Asking who's your one? We're a part of churches all across the nation that are doing this. That's very exciting. 23,000 different distribution kits that, we, that were sent out to churches, 23,000 have been sent out, 325,000 prayer guides for Who's Your One have been given away, 51,000 downloads of Who's Your One resources have been given away, 5.3 million impressions on social media about Who's Your One, a million, almost a million interactions with uh, uh, people liking and retweeting and commenting on who's your one post. Bookmarks being given away so that you can fill out a little, little card and tear it off and say who's your one and put it in the, the lobby of all of our campuses on display so we can pray for that. Individual people, it's going out all over the place and it's incredible. In our church, we've given out the prayer guides. We've given out the bookmarks. If you don't have them, just go to the lobby of any of the campuses and you can get them right there. But you know what? God starts working in individuals' hearts saying, how can I use my giftedness to make a difference in somebody else's life? Because you got to have a lot of hooks in the water if we're going to be fishermen of, uh, fishers of men, because people are different. So our Siena campus, Pastor Malcolm and Dimitri on our, at our Siena campus, they decided, they're both rappers, they decided they were going to come up with a who's your one rap. For some reason, they didn't ask me to be a part of it. I don't know why. Mine would be who can find the beat, you know, type of thing would be what I'd be trying to do. But they came up with this Who's Your One rap. It's on our, our YouTube channel. It's on our website. And I want to give you just a 15-second clip 
of this who's your one. Talk about reaching individuals. Everybody gets reached in a different way. This is coming out of our church. So I want you to watch this 15 minute just video clip of who's your one. If each one will reach one, we can teach one about the Son until the message of the Savior is replayed like a rerun. So please don't overlook the message of this song. If you're affected with the gospel, then you need to pass it on. Choose your one, choose your one. That's how you in the world. Who's your one, choose your one. Hey, what you waiting for? Who's your one, choose your one. Hey, what you waiting for? Who's your one, choose your one. That's how you in the world. Isn't that great? That's awesome. Man. And that might not be your style, but it's somebody's style. And it's a lot of people's style, actually, to tell you the truth. I like it. It's awesome. It's incredible. And it's been great to kind of drop that into that mix of all those stats. And the folks that are around the nation, they're like, man, that's awesome. They're going to start using it too, which is great to be able to have. So it's one person. And Andrew knew the value of one person. One person, you could get that off our website and send it to somebody you think might connect with that in a great way. That would be awesome. Let's be people that understand the value of one person. Let me give you another illustration. Have you heard the name D.L. Moody? He was the Billy Graham, basically, of the 1800s. Amazing man of God. But he started going to Sunday school when he was an 18-year-old kid, boy, and he went to Sunday school. And this guy named Edward Kimball, I bet you've never heard of Edward Kimball, was his Sunday school teacher in the 1800s. April 21st, 1855, Edward Kimball had on his heart, I need to go by the shoe store where D.L. Moody works, and I need to share Christ with him. And he got a little nervous and said, I shouldn't do that. Maybe I shouldn't. He said, well, I'm just going to go for it. God's leading me. I'm just going to do it. So he goes in, and by his own words, this is what Kimball said, I decided to speak to Moody about Christ and his soul. I started downtown to Holton's shoe store. When I was nearly there, I began to wonder whether or not I ought to go. But then I found him in the stock room, and I used his words, limping words, to share Christ with him. I never could remember exactly what I said, something about Christ and his love, and that was all. And I admit it was a weak appeal, but Moody, right then and there, gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And through D.L. Moody, tens of thousands of a people have come to Christ. Other ministers that have led tens of thousands of people have come to Christ. By this one guy, Edward Kimball, he had a one and he shared with his one and that one in that shoe store took off to reach tens of thousands of people. Moody Radio, Moody Bible Institute, um, uh, uh, Moody Church. I've actually been able to speak at the Moody Church in Chicago. They did my I Am Changes Who I Am book as a study through the whole church and I got to stand in his pulpit. It was such an honor to stand in that church, in that pulpit, and be a part of that legacy and that heritage. Tens of thousands of people because of one. Andrew knew the value of individual people. Number two, Andrew knew the value of small gifts to our big God. Small gifts. He just brought his brother. So I got to go tell my brother. Peter wasn't anything at that time. Want any big cheese? And he said, I just want to bring my small gifts. Peter knew the value of small gifts to our big God. Peter knew the value, or excuse me, Andrew knew the value of small gifts to our big God. Do you remember the story in Luke chapter 21 of the widow and the two mites? Everybody was given all this stuff. It was the widow and her two mites. And God said, that's big time to me. Small gifts in the hands of a big God. You know, we spend a lot of our lives saying, I can't, you know, I can't share my faith. You just put your small gift in the hands of a big God and see what God does. I, I, I can't teach that class. I can't teach that Bible study. Um, I, I, can't, I can't read. How am I going to read this Bible every day like you're talking about? I mean, this is like a thousands of years old document. What if somebody asked me to pronounce some of these words? I mean, what? I can't do that. Well, you just put your gift, a small gift, into the hands of a big God and just say, Lord, I'll take 10 minutes today. I'll take 15 minutes today. I'll give it to you. I'll trust you. Man, I tell you what, my whole life is just putting small gifts in the hands of God. I can't, Lord. Well, just, well, okay, maybe I can. I'll just put it in your hands and see what happens. And you take it over, Lord, and you do it your work. Andrew knew the value of small gifts in the hands of a big God. Let me show you in John chapter 6, verse 7. I'll put it up on the screens. This is the feeding of the 5,000. Philip answered him, Jesus, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. We don't have enough bread. One of his disciples, who is it? Andrew. Simon Peter's brother. He's always connected with Simon Peter, it seems like. Why did you be like your brother? Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here 
who has five barley loaves and two fish. You know, barley loaves, that was poor people food. Five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There's plenty of grass. Whenever Jesus is in the room, there's plenty. There's plenty of grass in that place. So they sat down and the men numbered about 5,000. And you know the rest of the story. They passed out these barley loaves, five barley loaves and two fish, poor people's food basically. And who brought that little boy to Jesus? Andrew. Said, I don't don't know. Philip's saying there's no way. But hey, I found one kid and he's got a little bit. Maybe, Maybe this can help. So what happens when this little boy puts bread and fish into the hands of a big God? 5,000 people plus are fed. And so I want to encourage you with who's your one. No gift is ins- insignificant in the hands of Jesus. No offering is insignificant in his hands. You give it to him at Siena, at, at Cyprus, at downtown, at the Loop, and say, Lord, it's yours. I, all I can do is surrender. I, I don't have any control of what you do with it. I just want to give you my gift, big, small, whatever it is. I want to give it to you, and I just want to bring people to Christ in an amazing way. Our church has such a rich history I'm going to tell you a little story of it. One of the first offerings, first gifts ever put in the hands of a big God. It was 1845, and five ladies were meeting in the home of Mrs. Piety Hadley. Now, is that a great first name for an 1800s Baptist woman or what? Piety, okay. So, Piety Hadley, and they were trying to build a new church building for our church. So, they were trying to raise money to build a church building. So ladies, you wonder if your leadership is is needed in the church. Amen, yes, all day long. Here's the five ladies meeting together to, to help with the building of the church. In connection with the raising of the funds for the building, a mule was donated to the women. Evidently in a spirit of derision or mockery. The women accepted the gift and at a bizarre plan with the fund, with the re- plan for raising funds, the mule was auctioned off. And their tidy sum under duress was delivered to the church, and the church building was subsequently built. Now, let me tell you the story. Five ladies are meeting in a house. Somebody brings them a mule making fun. Oh, y'all going to build a church building? Oh, you ladies are going to build a church building? Oh, okay. Let's see how this goes. We got a mule that we can donate. Come, let's, let's give you the mule, and let's see how that goes. And these ladies go, uh-huh, bring us a mule. We'll get it done. So they got what the, was the, the yard guy that would take care of the, the church, at the, or the houses and churches at the time. So he, they got him, and they said, hey, can you help us? And they fattened up the mule. And then they brought it to the bazaar, and they auctioned it off. And in auctioning off the mule, that was the first gift, one of the first gifts to ever be given to the church that then was used and given over to the Lord so that the first First Baptist Church building was built in downtown Houston at that time. Now, you think about that for just a second. A mule given in mockery, then given into the hands of the Lord by these godly ladies, then results into what we see today. And we may just be getting started. And so now in Cyprus in that beautiful building, in downtown Houston where we own an entire city block, in Siena that's busting at the seams that we need to build a building at, at the Loop Campus, at our faith centers all around town that we're giving food and clothing to people that can't afford it and sharing the gospel. Now we own like 14 or 15 properties, all from this one mule A small gift given into the hands of God. Do you know in the last eight years, in the last eight years, we've given over $82 million in missions away. $82 million in the last eight years. Now, I haven't done all the math, but that means in probably the, the last uh, uh, 10 years, we've given over $100 million away. But I know the math on the last eight years of $82 million from a mule given in mockery. What can God do when you place your small gift in the hands of a big God? Wow. Amazing. Andrew knew the value of individual people in a world of seven billion now we're in. Andrew knew the value of small gifts given to a big God. Number three out of four, Andrew knew the value of unseen service. 
Andrew knew the value of unseen service. He's just basically saying, I'm going to bring my brother to Christ. I'm going to bring Peter here to Christ. Andrew is a beautiful picture of all of those who labor quietly in, in unseen ways. You know, there's missionaries all over the world today. There's, there's, there's pastors all over the world today. They may never see the fruit of their ministry today. There's volunteers in our very church, hundreds of volunteers, and we always need more. Hundreds that are serving that may never see the value of taking care of those kids in preschool, taking care of those little ones, sharing with those teenagers, being able to make a difference in that life Bible study, serving throughout the week. They may never see that. But Andrew knew the value of unseen service. There is a value when you don't get your reward on this side of heaven. When you think about that, I, I want to give you a few quotes. Richard Foster wrote a book called Celebration of Discipline. It's a classic. It's decades old. And he compares self-righteous service with true service. Self-righteous service comes through human effort. True service comes from a relationship with God. Self-righteous is impressed with the big deal. True service will do the small. Self-righteous requires external rewards. True service rests in hiddenness and eternal rewards. Self-righteous is highly concerned about results. True service is free of the need to calculate results. Self-righteous is affected by moods and whims. True service is faithful. Self-righteous is temporary. True service is a lifestyle. Self-righteous, lastly, fractures community. True service builds community. See, we've got to be people. We want to be people. Andrew was the type of person that didn't mind being hidden because he knew the value of unseen service. And for us to be wanting to reach our one and to reach the world, it's individual people, it's small gifts in the hands of a big God, and it's unseen service. There's a lot of unseen that happens, and that's where it happens. There's more practice than there is game. And in that, that unseen service is where the faithfulness grows. It's where the faithfulness grows. Andrew knew that value. I'll tell you a story of a lady here in our church. Her mom came to Christ. Her dad had not come to Christ. And her mom died. Her dad lived about three more years after her mom died. And he was an unbeliever. He was an older gentleman. He was struggling with grief. And he got a little hard to deal with. That can happen. And so she tells the story of her mother passed away, and she says this, her words, not mine. My father was lost without her in many ways, more than one. He was alone. He was riddled with anxiety, and he was bitter, and he was unsaved. He was a difficult man. I think it's safe to say that for all of us, my brothers, my, sister, my brother, my sisters, and my mother, we struggled with his moods, his bad temper, his inability to show love and affection. He had no interest in God, no interest in church, or anything related in any way to religion. He did not understand my relationship or my life with Christ, my relationship as a Christian. My efforts to witness to him always left me disheartened. You know, any family members like that? You just kind of, you feel like you're, you're just trying, but you're always leaving a little bit disheartened. But her mom, who died and had gone on to heaven, had two friends, Mary and Evelyn. And when her dad got sick, Mary and Evelyn said, you know, Evelyn said, you know what, I'm, we need to share Christ with him. And so they begin to visit him in the hospital. They begin to minister to him. They begin to, to share Christ with him. In her words again, they witnessed to my dad in the midst of his physical suffering and his intense fear of dying. In his last days, thanks to Mary and Evelyn's unwavering commitment, remember the unseenness, the unseen service, and their unwavering commitment to continue to speak to him about salvation and eternal life. Listen, my father gave his life to Christ the day before he passed away. Yeah, cheer for that. Come on. Family members sharing. Family members giving it all they got. Mom's gone on to be to he in heaven. Dad's getting older and getting closer to death. He's getting ornery about it. And these two ladies who don't have to, they already took care of the mom in a tremendous way. 
began sharing Christ with this dad, and the day before he dies, he comes to Christ. She says, even though I know in my head that no one is beyond the reach of Christ, I confess that I often doubted that my father would ever be saved. But look at what God did. From me to my mother, she had led her mom to Christ. From me to my mother, to Mary, to Evelyn, to my father, the saving message of Jesus Christ was passed. Sometimes it takes someone other than family to witness to the family. But God has shown me that I can never underestimate the power to communicate through others. She even says in another part, she says, I'm sure my mom was shocked when he walked into heaven. (laughs) The value of unseen service. What you do is important. And we've got in our minds, if you're not famous, you can't make an impact. That's not true. If you're not Hollywood, this, that, or the other, if you're not known from here to there, that's not true. It's every one of us serving the Lord because here's the deal. Unseen service gets about Jesus. You know, your marriage is really not about you. It's not about your spouse. It's about Jesus. Your parenting, it's not about you. It's not about the kids even. It's about serving Jesus. This message that I'm preaching is really not for you. You're getting to listen in. But this is for Jesus is what this is. I want to I please Him. Our church, it's not about you, it's not about me, it's not about really even us, it's about Jesus. And what happens with unseen service is you get the rewards from Jesus. You get the the feeling in your heart of I did something important from Jesus. And it's so hard in our flesh, and I like an attaboy like anybody else does, but to be able to just say, Lord, let it be for you, the value of unseen service. Andrew didn't preach to multitudes. He didn't found any churches in the New Testament. He just brought Peter to Christ and brought a little boy's loaves. And we see Andrew's fingerprints all throughout the Scriptures. And then Peter stood up and preached to thousands. You never know what God's going to do. Fourth and lastly, last one I want to tell you this about Andrew. Andrew knew the value of faithfulness. Andrew knew the value of faithfulness. This wasn't just one thing that he did. He was knowing the value of faithfulness. His name means manly. Nine accounts in the Scriptures, and they're all kind of pass-bys with Andrew. Andrew's always bringing somebody to Christ. He's bringing the D.L. Moody to Christ, if you will, with Peter. And to, to be able to declare he knew the value of faithfulness. And I just want to tell you, church, let's stay at it. Let's stay at it. Just be faithful. I asked a, a financial um, consultant that goes to our church. I said, well, you know, what's the, what, tell me, what's, what do you tell your clients? What's the thing that you say? Here's what he said. I thought this was so wise. Hit singles. Just continually hit singles financially over and over. Everybody wants to invest $10,000 in Google 1982 and then make $10 million. But he said, but you know what? A lot of those 10000 end up being lost. Now, there's some home runs that you can hit for sure and hope that my clients do. But if you just keep hitting singles over and over, young people hear that, hitting singles over and over, show up early, stay a little late every day at work, and you'll get the promotion and do a good job. Just keep hitting singles over and over and over and over. And so what's Andrew doing? He's just hitting singles. He's Pete Rose without the cheating, you know? I mean, that's what's happening. (laughs) He's getting it going and making it happen with hitting singles, and really that's what it comes down to in parenting, isn't it? It's just hitting some singles. Marriage, it's not rocket science. It's hitting some singles each day. Financial security, it's hitting some singles and doing things right. Spending time with the Lord. Which quiet time out of the tens of thousands that I've had, which, which was the one that changed my life? Yes. It's a cumulative effect. It's a cumulative effect. Andrew was faithful. Let me give you this last illustration. About 15 years ago, um, I I had a sabbatical time, first time that I had ever done that, and I went to Durango, Colorado. And in Durango, Colorado, Kelly and I went and ate at a restaurant there, and it was awesome. I mean, Colorado in the summer, wow. I mean, how much better can it get? It was great. It was right before I was going to come on to be here as a pastor. So basically for a month, I just said, help, <laughs> Lord, help. And really today, I still say, help, Lord, help. I'm still saying it. And he does, and he is, and he will, right? It's just small gifts in the hands of a big God. And so we went to this restaurant. Kelly and I went to this restaurant called Ken and Sue's Restaurant. 
I have not been to Durango since that time. I've not eaten at that restaurant since that time. But at that time, I must have signed up to be on their mailing list. For every quarter, basically, for the last 15 years, I've gotten a postcard from Ken and Sue's. For 15 years. Now, I can tell you two things. One, they should maybe kind of clean out their mailing list. Okay, that's one thing we could say. But here's what I want you to see, and here's what I want you to know. I want you to see faithfulness, perseverance. I don't know Ken. I don't know Sue. I haven't eaten there in over 15 years. But let me tell you what. If I ever go to Durango, Colorado again, let me tell you where I'm going. First place we're going to eat. And we're getting appetizers and the main course and dessert. I mean, it's going to be awesome. Their faithfulness over and over and over, quarterly, just bam, ba bam, ba bam for 15 years, sending me this, that, and the other. I literally took this very postcard and I put it on my, on my uh, dresser in my closet to just remind me of perseverance and faithfulness when I was going through a little difficult season. Just stay with it. Stay with it. Stay with it. Keep at it. Ken and Sue could keep at it. You can keep at it. Let's stay with it. Let's keep going. Let's keep trusting that there's a big God and he wants to do something great through you and he wants to do something in your one and make a huge difference. So I don't know, Ken, I don't know, Sue, but I sure appreciate their faithfulness and they just got some free advertising with thousands of people in Houston right now, right? (laughs) We'll send them the clip and they'll be excited. I'll get free uh, appetizer maybe when I get there. I don't know. (laughs) Andrew knew the value of faithfulness. Be faithful in your marriage. Be faithful in your parenting. Be faithful at your office. Be faithful in your faith. And let's keep at it. And you never know what God can do when we just put a mule in his hands and let him do what he wants to do. Do you know Christ is your Savior? Are you the one, maybe, that you need to trust Jesus as your Savior? And say, Lord, forgive my sins and wash me clean and live inside my heart. Or does God need to lay a one on your heart? Or do you need to just grow in your faith? We're going to do a men's retreat. Men, Andrew's name means manly. October 4th and 5th, we're going to take all the guys who want to go and we're going to get away just for a bit, 24 hours, and be able to just talk about what it means to be a man of God. I'm going to go. We want to invite you to come too, to just put that cumulative effect in your life of growing in Christ. Let God do something great. And here's what will happen. If we'll value individual people, if we'll put our small gifts in the hands of a big God, if we'll value unseen service and we'll value faithfulness, who knows what God can do in your life and in my life? Father, we come in Jesus' name and we give you thanks. You're so good to us. You're so great, so mighty. Lord, for years upon years, we've just put into your hands small gifts. And look at what you've done. Lord, help us to keep hitting singles. There'll be some doubles, some triples, a home run here and there. But Lord, let us just be faithful. We don't have to be perfect. Just let us be faithful and keep at it. What does Jesus have for you? What do you need to pray back to Him? Who's your one? At all of our campuses, we're going to have people that are ready to talk to you. For you to take that first step with Jesus Christ or to take your next step with Jesus Christ and growing in your faith through baptism or life Bible study or getting involved or volunteering, whatever it is. Let God do His work. I promise you'll be grateful. Father, as we respond to you in worship and in our hearts, we just lay our small lives in the hands of a big God. That's the beauty of the gospel. We're so small. We're so small, Lord. You're so big, and we just surrender. We lay ourselves in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for watching. To find out more about Houston's First, you can subscribe to our channel, or you can go to houstonsfirst.org.